We find that it's made in the pineal gland, which is smack dab in the middle of the brain. In fact, there's an old crystal triangle there that I'll refer to a little later with the pituitary, the pineal gland, and the hypothalamus. Now, what about that gland? And uh, what do we got going here? Now, here's my, here's my favorite little boy. This is Spiny. And Spiny, as you see at the bottom, says the body in harmony. Hormone is the ancient Greek word for harmony. And so when the seals are open, the body is in harmony. Doc used the term seals. What's a seal? If you can think of something that opens and closes, a seal. Same seals that are referred to in Revelation, by the way. There are seven seals in the body. In traditional medicine, these would be referred to as the endocrine system or your glandular system. They all produce hormones. Now let's jump quickly to the fourth seal here, or the thymus gland that sits smack dab in the middle of your chest. Now if I were to ask most of my colleagues what the thymus gland did, well, the pineal gland did, they'd have to fumble a little bit. Because that's not taught to us in medical school. Maybe a sentence or two, but that's about it. But as I look at this fourth seal, let me tell you about some of the, the beautiful things that happened there. Notice that it sits right next to the heart. Studies have been done in physics to show that when you are happy, I don't know what it takes to make you happy, but let's say you are happy today. If I put an EKG up to your heart at that time, you would find that your heart would be beating to the rhythm of a waltz. That rhythm happens to be the energy that comes over and opens up the fourth seal or the thymus gland. And an ultraviolet light and an ultraviolet liquid begins to emanate from that gland and goes down to the base of your spine and just sits there like a pool. So then when you're sitting in Indian style with your legs crossed and saying your prayers or meditating, it's just natural that that tailbone just happens to sit right into or slip right into that pool of liquid and begins to course its way up the spinal cord like this, opening up each one of those glands. Now again, there's no nerve, there's no wire coming from these glands to other parts of the body. And for years in traditional medicine, we haven't known well, what makes them open and close. Well, I just told you, happiness opens up that fourth one of the thymus gland. And that's your protection. That's the one that deals with your protection against infection. That deals with your protection against um, cancer. You build your immune system, okay? If I look at the sixth seal, which would be the pineal gland, one of my favorite glands, which is the sixth seal in that list of seven seals, I find that serotonin and melatonin, that goes Sarah and Mel, are made in the pineal gland. Now, all of the bioavailable waters happen to cause the pineal gland to vibrate or to open up that gland. You can't even get to the seventh gland, the pituitary gland, unless the pineal gland is stimulated. But here's the rub. That pineal gland is also sensitive and of the same frequency or what causes it to open and close as microwave towers. What's a microwave tower? What do you have beamed with your cellular phone? Within probably three block radius of here, I'm sure you have at least 10 microwave towers in the city. So I am wearing out 
your pineal gland by you being exposed to that frequency because you had a natural advantage because you were born with the beautiful pigment we're all born with it some more than others that allow that pineal gland to operate at peak performance it's simply melanin and when i look at the black spot at the back of my eye called the macula and understand that that should be loaded with melanin and when I look at macular degeneration which means that it looks like somebody spit into that area there are white punctate spots in the macula it's because you're no longer making melanin it means you've been exposed to electromagnetic bombardment and your pineal gland has begun to shrink down and stop operating. Now, when you're a baby, that gland and your thymus gland are roughly the size of a walnut. If it has not been properly stimulated, it shrinks down to the size of a pea and stops operating. So again, it is very important, number one, that you put the right fuel into that brain so they can operate at peak performance and you also want to shield that brain from the electromagnetic bombardment that is present today so i've got to restore to it what it needs to allow it to operate at peak performance get the message you have to have a natural substance to do that melanin in itself will absorb radiation so how do i restore that again the waters will allow that to happen. The noni juice will allow that to happen also. And that's a very special juice. You hear me referring to it because it even looks like the plant itself even looks like the pineal gland, as does the pineapple, as does the pine cone. Very important. And to understand that in this setting, you are being bombarded. You have to put up a shield against that bombardment. What other thing turns on these glands? Music. So that the first seal is open, a very powerful seal, is open by the beat of the bass drum. And when used appropriately, can be used to help move that energy up, opening up the seals. But if it's stagnant, if it gets there and has nowhere to go, then what's open? your male and female sex organs. Ever leave work and wonder, I didn't leave work feeling sexy today, but by the time you got home, something happened. Or looking at our athletes who are so focused, or entertainers who are so focused during their performance, that they have moved that energy all the way up. And now all of a sudden it crashes down to the first seal. So what happens after a game or a performance? They all want to screw. If someone had just told them that was their most creative time, and if they'd gone out and begun to write, to, to write or to play music, it would have been fantastic, or to write music. Now, what opens up the upper seals? A violin. It's not in vogue for guys to play the violin. They turned them off. Hmm? No, just the opposite. You should be encouraged to play the violin. It opens up those upper glands and allows the magic to happen. Now, what I say when I say magic, who's the more primitive? If I have to send a message to you over miles by a satellite or wires going under the ocean on a telephone, what's more primitive, that or I can simply look on your face with my eyes closed and send you the message and you receive it that's the natural advantage that you were born with and that you can do all but two percent of the average brain is turned off what do you think happens with the rest of that 98 percent just sitting there waiting for potential for you to open it and allow it to happen you were given all the tools you just got to learn how to use them. And again, that body wants to be, that brain wants to be 90% water. 
Now, where else do we have brains? About five years ago, in traditional medicine, we discovered that we have brains in our digestive tract. Hmm, what's happening there? Where are they? In our tonsils? In our appendix, and if I were to go around this room, I'd probably find out that half of you no longer have either of those. Okay, because several years ago, we didn't know what they were for. And the third place is in the first part of the small intestine. There's an area called Peyer's Patches. Now, what do I mean by brains? You ever watch a toddler put everything in their mouth? I mean, everything they grab, dirt, um, the chair, um, your food, their food, the hat, whatever. They're, they're collecting a diary of information. And in that diary, it says, if later on I need a substance, I need to know what I can get from each of those substances. So that if I eat the red clay of Georgia, I know I can get iron from it if my body needs it. Now, where does it test it? As it passes the tonsils, it says, well, we need calcium today. We need a little potassium. Give me a little manganese, etc." It proceeds on down this one long tube because your digestive tract is one long tube open on either end, mouth on one side, anus on the other. And we draw from it as it passes down that tube. So as it gets to that part of the small intestine, it says, no, nope, didn't take enough out. Guess we need some more. And it gets to the appendix and says, all right, we're getting ready to enter the large bowel. And what's the function of the large bowel? To say there's enough water in the body to send that 90% water up to the brain. Because if that brain stops, you stop. Now, if you talk to the average drug addict, and I'm going to say drug, remember all those things I had on that list. I didn't only have heroin, I had sugar there too. And I had alcohol. And by the way, a recovering heroin addict will usually become a alcoholic en route to getting better and will start craving sugar like crazy. Notice they don't have any front teeth most of the time because they crave sugar so much. So don't be on them. It's just as hard for you to come off that sugar or come off that salt or those cigarettes as it is to come off of the stronger illegal drugs. Because your body doesn't know legal versus illegal. It just knows it's hard to come off. Now, these brains are important because they dictate what you're allergic to, what you like and don't like, and what you eat. Now, one of my patients is a well-known uh, entertainer that many of you would know. I won't say his name, but for years, he has gone and not liked onions. And, and he's still giving me permission, so I'll see David. Doesn't like onions. He said, um, he said, I don't know why I don't like onions. His mother's still alive. She was over 100. And I said, Mrs. Davis, why not you like onions? She said, well, you know, in the old days, when we were weaning babies from the breast, we used to put onion juice on the nipple. So the association to him was something untoward happened when I was around that onion juice as I was collecting that diary during those first couple of years of life. So that registered as, uh-uh, that's not something I want. When we look at these brains and we look at allergies, we find that if I make the connection with food to something that wasn't so good, when I ate that food, I develop an allergy to it. So let's say I'm going to pick on peas because there's a number of people that don't like peas. And let's say it was a bad day at work for mom or dad. And they came home that day and I'm sitting at the table and there are peas in front of me. Well, my body just didn't happen to need peas that day. Okay? But eat your peas. But I don't want my peas. Eat your peas. But I don't want my peas. Huh. <laughs> Next time peas introduced to me, it remembers that the last time we ate them, something didn't connect so well. So I'm not sure that I want them. So now I'm getting nauseous at even the thought of them. Or I may actually throw up. Now how do we prove that? We actually bypass the digestive tract and inject it into the 